Hello and welcome to Off the Record. Jesse and I are back this week. I am sweaty from Warp Tour. Jesse is sweaty from humidity. Uh, you know, I gotta tell you, I haven't left the studio since yesterday, so I'm a bit in air conditioning, so I'm not the least bit sweaty. Thank you very much for assuming. I am sweaty from humidity, so. Uh, I stepped off a plane from LaGuardia yesterday and I was like, oh, right, that's what that is. It's, it's rough out there on tour, Jesse. As I said, you were making the mistake that everybody miss, makes uh, once a couple times in their life of going out on that godforsaken tour. Yeah, I, uh, I'll never be the same, but I'm back. I'm back to do this. What, what do we have for some follow-up? Well, the first bit of follow-up is, um, so, so I released the 2015 edition of my book this week. You know, so it has a uh, 100 updated and new pages in it and all this fun stuff in it. And, uh, you know, there's all juicy tidbits about Tidal and Apple Music so that it's hip and new. So it's going to be defunct uh, about Tidal in like a day or two. <laughs> you're going to have to get out. Of, you're going to have to get a version two out the door. Yeah, I mean, you know, we, we never know when that could fall. Um, but, you know, a funny thing happened along the way. So I sent out a thing to everybody who's ever downloaded an excerpt of it, the book along the way. And some asshole sent me back a thing within one minute that says, if you want me to read your book, you can use my Fluence profile and pay me to read it. Oh, whoa. So is this like an industry insider or what? I, I You know what the funny thing is, is they have like, I'm not going to embarrass them, but like they have some like shitty, like their literal of their startup was like a tech term hugger. And I just thought it was so funny. It's like, dude, you downloaded an excerpt of my book, and now you're writing me something like this? You have some fucking nerve. Um, but I also thought that was a funny thing since we've talked about fluence and how it could be evil. And, hey, there's the evil right there. Anytime you ask me to do anything, I'm going to just now send you a link to my uh, fluence profile. Well, I think pretty good because i think you asked me to do more things for you that i asked you to do for you so i'm just gonna send you to my paypal from now on i mean we pay you y you do pay me you do pay me um everyone i'm, I'm just saying so can play this game. profile so he can read his book for you <laughs> um the last bit of follow-up is i wanted to thank uh everybody who supported me with the uh lady gaga tattoo problem i uh Sadly, got more feedback and condolences for that than when I came out for having cancer on the podcast. So, so that's how I, you know I, it's <laughs> real. Holy shit. <laughs> when I so, saw that tattoo, by the way, <laughs> yeah. I thought it was a small thing. It's like a oh, tattoo. No. Oh, yeah. It's a, it's a, it, it is a five-line Lady Gaga tattoo. I truly thought you meant like it just said born this way. No, 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 no. It's like five lines of the song. Yeah, that was wild to me. I mean, um, didn't you also remember the part of the story where it took me five months to realize that was Lady Gaga? So, like, I would have realized that if it just said bored this way. That's why I was so shocked. But this, I don't know, like, if this makes it more or less interesting than me to me that it was like, it's like a tattoo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sure is. And that, my mom and I had a long talk about it. She was like, wow, you see that tattoo? I was like, I do see it, mom. I do see it. Uh, Jesse's a sellout. <laughs> I know that was what a lot of the, the feedback was, was telling me that I'm not punk, but th when they see my new tattoo in the next week or two, um, they're going to know I'm punk. You know, I, I, I initially you probably had, got a Kesha tattoo to match. Yeah, totes. I, I actually, that would be the pop star tattoo I would probably get. Um, um, I've already was her for Halloween though once, so that, that, that kind of took care of that. Wow. Did you get a wig? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll post that picture next. Oh, great. This is con uh, this is concerning to me, but that's okay. <laughs> I, you know, I was going to get my tattoo that cancels this out on Saturday, but you're having your graduation party, and I can't miss it. Good thing I graduated. We well, might yeah, have another yeah. tattoo instead of then. That could I might have. I saved you. Well, it's nice to see you've kept busy in the entire few days that you've been graduated. Yes, I'm miserable. Uh, the real world is terrible. I'm ready to go back to college, Jesse. I don't know, because the way I see it, I think everything's going your way, because you, you know what we have to do now is we have to do the thing I hate to do and you love to do, which is discuss Queen Fuck Girl Taylor Swift. 
Oh, I thought you meant talk about myself, but I know you love talking about <laughs> yourself too. So clearly, clearly I should have guessed Taylor. Um, yeah. Father's day was not about fathers at all. It was about Taylor Swift. Um, so this was, this will come out on Thursday. We're recording this on Tuesday on Sunday, the 21st of June. Taylor Swift released a long open letter to Apple on Tumblr, of all places, sharing her frustration with Apple Music and outrage that they were not paying any artists or labels or, in general, rights holders. And when we say rights holders throughout this conversation, we mean the person that owns or the person or entity that owns the music. In some instances, a label owns music. In other instances, an artist owns music. In other other instances, a manager owns music. So uh, she was shocked and outraged that Apple was not paying rights holders during their three-month trial. Uh, And the short and long of her lengthy blog post was she was taking on the position of, I'm not doing this for myself. I am very well off and very fortunate. I'm doing this for all the indie artists who do not have a voice. Um, And then to do a quick roundup of the summary of what happened after, within 17 hours on that same Sunday, Apple re- uh, retracted and switched their policy to pay artists or rights holders during the trial period uh, for a number that looks to be incredibly small, actually, as it came out today, it might be uh, 0.002 cents per stream, which is one fifth of a penny. We can get into that later. And that's where we are right now. And Taylor Swift, uh, depending on your opinion, is either a sung or unsung hero or a monster. Is that a good summary? A fuck girl is what I would like to say. Is that all we have to contribute to this conversation? Should we move on? Basically. Well, I think you actually touched on something that I think is very interesting that we should we, we could get into that I don't think a lot of people are discussing, which is I think this has become a very big deal in some ways also because if you like Taylor Swift like you or you hate her like me, it seems that really is whatever side people tend to be on with this. And I think that's a really funny thing because what I thought about is, um, in fact, my friend uh, E.L. Levy started a great discussion of this on uh, Facebook. And uh, he said, you know, Lars Ulrich basically said the same thing during the Napster. Now, Lars did make the mistake of that he didn't make it about small artists first. And I think Taylor Swift is a charlatan for that. But I'll get into the more of that later because I think the greater point is, is that if you... The internet, especially writers, love Taylor Swift because she's the ultimate clickbait. Like, I think somebody at one point, it was like Upworthy or something, showed that if you just put Taylor Swift in anything, you can immediately get like a million more clicks. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And so she's the ultimate clickbait, so people love writing about this. But I think it is really funny is that it's just like in general, I really think that this is like a, almost Republicans, Democrats thing of that people kind of line up on the side of it. But And I also think it was that thing of like people really were – fed up with Metallica's bullshit. They were at that point kind of the Metallica of their day. They had sold out so hard. Even most of their diehard fans hated them. And when Lars came around having an $80 million or whatever art collection, they're saying this, it was just like totally silly. And, you know, I do think that there's legitimate things on both sides. I mean, you know, the joke goes that, you know, people are like, Taylor Swift saved the music business. Like, no, she got people paid for a three-month trial. She actually did. She got... Uh, she barely got people paid, but yeah. yeah. Uh, and, but but I, I think though to, to f- finish it off too is, and also she was not the first one to do this. Um, you know, DFA records, which is a very huge popular dance and indie label. Is that the one from France? Label? No, that's, uh, New York. That's LCD sound systems label. Got it, Cause uh, there's a whole Fran, Fran, yeah, a whole French like consortium of labels also came out against Apple music over the weekend, I believe. Yeah, and then, you know, then hilariously, um, Digital Music News printed Anton Newcomb, who um, you might remember from me talking about the um, documentary Dig. He's the crazy person in that documentary I was talking about on the Jeff Casaza episode. Uh, He came out screaming about Apple and made up all sorts of crazy lies, and then Digital Music prints it like it's fact as usual because they're a hideous, hideous publication. Yeah, um, what's interesting to me is like there's there's a lot of few things that are interesting to me here. Some people thought it was there was a conspiracy <laughs> that <laughs> that uh, some people thought that like Apple asked Taylor Swift to post this blog so they could swap it and like 
I think it is pretty incredible that Apple swapped their position in what appears to have been 17 hours, right? But what I would say, and Jesse, let me know if you agree or not, I believe that Apple was probably going to announce sometime this week that they were changing their position anyway. Would you I, agree I, on that or not? I think you're right, and I think I think there is a, a, a very interesting retort to people who th- see this, because I, I saw a lot of smart friends thinking this was kind of a conspiracy theory. Yes. Like, you know, and I think one of the things that we have to remember now is in the wake of how many bad press accidents there have been, whether it's like the South Carolina flying the Confederate flag, things are changing way faster now because people have finally seen enough PowerPoint presentations that you have to get ahead of any controversy and figure out what's the risk reward as soon as possible. And this is just the beginning of an era where we're going to see these things change really fast. If this was three years ago, that Confederate flag would be still be hanging for two more weeks. And I think that this is a perfect indication of like, you know, I was reading in Fast Company about the um, Starbucks story of when they did that race together thing. And, you know, they did not flip that around fast enough, even though it was pretty fast compared to how often these things happen. I think everybody's gotten that memo by now that when this something of this magnitude happens and you see the Google trend go up, you better hurry up and make a decision. Totally. And beyond that, I would say, like, Apple is nearly a trillion dollar company. And I do think it is like, Look, they made a mistake here. I was pretty, I didn't think that they were going to change their mind. But like what I originally wrote was, I think this is shitty. This should be a write-off for Apple. Uh, It doesn't really matter. It'll be at most, God, I don't know, a few hundred million dollars at most, I think, you know. Nearly a rounding error for them. A rounding error for a company that makes, uh, I don't know, $70 billion of uh, revenue per quarter. Uh, they they'll make they would make as much in a couple hours of the day basically as uh, they would have had to cost them for three months or or what it will cost them now. Um, but that like that being said, I am happy that they changed their mind, even if it's not going to pay the artist the full amount. I think it's important to see them pivot so quickly, and I think it also said there's been a lot of talk too about like why doesn't Apple just abandon music? Like they're not in control. Apple likes being in control of everything. I think they care uh, about music, and I think they definitely messed up and got greedy here because I I think most uh, trillion-dollar companies, and there aren't any besides Apple, would get greedy if they could, right? But I do think it's important that they did swap. Um, But I I think I want to talk a little bit more about the Taylor Swift post, uh, which I think you and I are actually going to mostly agree on. Um, I, I, I think Apple was smart to hop on the, we love Taylor Swift train. This makes perfect sense to us. We're going to swap out what we were doing. It was a good like cover up for them, but at the same time, well, actually, Jesse, let me ask you a question. Do you think Taylor Swift's the most powerful person in the music industry? I think Taylor, because see the powerful is the wrong thing. I think Taylor Swift is one of the most influential people in the industry, but I think that more people if Beyonce came out on a debate stage against Taylor Swift on a subject, I think Beyonce is going to win. Like education wise? No, like let's just say you put Beyonce and Taylor Swift on two sides of the issue. I think that as far as swayable people who are just going to follow the one entity, like just that we were talking about, that I think a lot of this came down to whether you hate or like Taylor Swift. I think a lot more people are going to come down on Beyond, Team Beyonce. Okay, I don't disagree. I think she has like the most sway though. I don't know, Taylor. Mm. I think I think I think I think Taylor Swift has like Beyonce has a very young audience too, but I think Taylor Swift's audience is like a lot more young and vocal on the internet, you know? I think they're also a lot more white. Sure. No, no doubt. <laughs> I mean, I I think that's the thing. Beyonce's audience is vast and uh diverse, whereas Taylor's is just a bunch of young girls and some adults and some 20 somethings who do this and then a bunch of boys who think she's cute and somehow tolerate her shitty songs. Okay. Not, not that boys can't like her shitty songs genuinely, but they're shitty songs. What I, what I had kind of like a problem with her statement was she wrote it. The first line is literally, I write this to explain while I'll be holding my, my holding back my album 1989 from the new streaming service. 
And then the rest of the post is about, this is not about me. This is about artists, blah, blah, blah. So Apple caved, but the consensus is that 1989 is still not going to be on the streaming portion of Apple Music. Yeah, which makes her, which will make her a charlatan. That, that'll make her a charlatan. Right. And which to me is pure bullshit. And I, I don't think that she needs to have it streaming on Apple Music. I think the majority of people who bought Apple, who bought 1989, which is millions of people, bought it through iTunes which means it will show up in those people's libra- libraries anyway and that they won't be missing it because they'll have it right there, you know? Like, that is a thing. But, and like, by the way, people who have Spotify but bought the album because they wanted to hear it and couldn't on Spotify, if they were to switch to Apple Music, they would have it too in their iTunes library anyway, so they would be fine because it's all going to be integrated. But it, it, it really kind of puzzled me. I was like, look, I don't care if you're doing this for your album or, f- or for independent artists or for both. But you said you were doing it for two things, and you're still not going to change. Uh, you're still not going to change your mind on what you promised in the first sentence. So it's, I, I, at the end of the day, I kind of, if it actually turned out that she was the one that changed Apple's mind, I appreciate her. You know, um, I, I think, sure, why not? But it, I don't think enough people are like seeing through this letter. And I don't really also know why she did it in that case. Because if she wanted to get paid for 1989, she now can, but won't be. And her the part about caring for artists was kind of like an afterthought. So I don't know. It was a little confusing. I, well, I, I think I do know. So one, it's speculation whether she's going to do it right or not since we're taping before she's set her decision. But... Um, if she doesn't, she's a charlatan and she was full of shit. And I think just as I said, when we first had to get into it, when she got in the fight with Spotify, I think she does whatever's best for her and her wallet. And then claims it's about other things because there's actually really great evidence. So friend of the show, uh, Nick Carp, who's a photographer, linked me to a great article um, called on nextshark.com where somebody wrote in uh, open response to Taylor Swift's rant against Apple, where they showed that if she actually cared about artists, she wouldn't have the most aggressive power grab against photographers and basically exploits photographers who are artists and takes them for way more than they should ever be taken for and basically does the most aggressive rights grab in photography today by making sure photographers don't get paid when they use anything that's affiliated with her. If Taylor Swift was really this champion of artists that she claims to be um, every time. And I think that really what always shows your dedication to anything is how uncomfortable you make yourself in order to do something. And the fact is, is like somebody made the argument like, Oh, Taylor Swift takes smaller bands on tour. Taylor Swift takes bands. She doesn't have to pay big money out to on tour because she knows that she'll sell out the shows whether she has an opening act or not and it doesn't matter who it is so if it's somebody who's willing to pay a buy on to do the opening act she can do it it's always this convenient thing of that she's able to get the best of somebody while posing and pretending to be the good guy i think that's actually her whole shtick is she pretends she's this like it is a girl it's just the haters who talk shit when really she's a vacuous fuck girl very very witty though smart 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 woman uh, you know, uh, you I, know I, I i just i just i don't i don't see it well I'm very excited to see her in concert so, next month so one last one last thing though i did want to give a shout out to the the um conspiracy theorists i will apologize to all of you and kiss your shoes if apple does indeed buy big machine records and this was all planned oh man i didn't think about that one mm, I, I realized that while we were talking Oh, right. As Jesse and I talked about months ago now, probably in the, you know, after 2000, like after the new year in the winter, or maybe even last year at this point, I don't know. There's been rumors that Apple was going to buy uh, her record label and put out her next music um, and own her back catalog. Oh, man. Yeah. So that, if that, if that, if that happens, like 10% more on the conspiracy side than I was, not 10% more than reality, but like 10% more I, than. If that if that happen if that if that happens, I apologize. And um, yes, JFK was murdered by the Russians too, too, as well, just as a concession. And like, oh man, that would be something. Because I mean, look, at the end of the day, Apple and Taylor Swift have a really good relationship. <laughs> so this whole thing has just been interesting. Um, like, if she needed to make a point out of them, or if she just couldn't call someone at Apple personally, or have her managers do so, but. 
Um, that that's more why I think it was a uh, a little bit of a publicity stunt because she as easily could have threatened Apple inside and been like, "Look, I'm going to write a whole letter, and I don't want to threaten you, but like this is really important to me. You know, I'm right. Let's do this." And then she could have made a joint statement with them, but she didn't. So I I, I think there's that aspect too. Um, I can't believe we're mostly agreeing about something on Taylor Swift. I know, I know. So, 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 so let me take this someplace else that my mind went this week, though. So, like, watching this unfold, and you know I was, I, 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 let me say this, like, I was so happy that I had a long day in the studio and I didn't have to see more of my friends' comments on this subject yesterday, and I had to actually work. Um, I keep having this thought, and I think we've discussed it a little after I watched the Katy Perry movie, that I think it... And it ties into the uh, girl I'm dating's tattoo, too. Taylor Swift, Katy Perry, and Lady Gaga pulled the greatest wool-over-the-eyes move I've ever seen by getting the generation of millennials to think that they are rebellion culture and that they're for people who don't fit in. And it really just blows me away that they've done that. And what I realize that makes it relevant to this podcast is when we talk about how punk records and we were talking about the the butter analogy the other week about how things have flattened, I think one of the reasons that you don't see as big sales in like true punk rebellion music and you see your generation being a little bit more of like willing to wear Abercrombie, whereas my generation of punk would never have been able to war- wear that to a show you would have been chased out. You think Abercrombie out. is the right example then? No, 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 listen, listen, listen. You might not be good. Like, I'm saying, like, Abercrombie is very conformist clothing compared to, like, a punk shirt like you and I wear. You're saying most people uh, who, like... I, I'm saying there that there is a thing that you can feel part of rebellion culture and still be able to align yourselves with these people and feel like somebody's comforting you in your rebellion when you listen to Katy Perry, Lady Gaga, and Taylor Swift, like, to different degrees, obviously, too. But, like, that never would have flown. And I think that that's actually a reason that you don't see as much punk and metal. And you see so many people who dress normal compared to, like, my previous generation and participate in subculture. Like, it always shocks me when I'm at the pop punk shows now when I see kids there who we would have skinned alive and hung out front on a tree with their clothes, like, if they had showed up at a punk show dressing that preppy. And I th- really think that that's been a genius move of these pop stars, but it's also a thing of that's what steals from your from some of punk's uh, power in uh, having an audience. Mm. Punk punk, yeah. Not not punk punk. You got to realize. Remember when I was young, there was no like. I mean, I guess there was more punk punk, but like in like pop punk, kids would still get shunned, but not to the extent that today. I'm not talking about the difference between a whether it's a rise against or the Menzingers to a man overboard. I just think in general, like it's this is what took away from that, and it even took away from like the Hollywood undead kids that they were able to then fought, be a little monster, one of Lady Gaga's fan club instead. And I think it's, you know, it is a amazing feat that they did this. I think that's some of why Taylor Swift has so much influence is so many people, you know, this whole thing that like, I'm different. I'm not that type of girl. Like all those other girls, she wears shorts where I wear da, 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 da. Like it's, it's unbelievable to me that they were able to pull this off. They rule the world, Jesse. Who who, run, who runs the world? Girls. Here we are podcasting on a Tuesday afternoon. We should have been pop stars. <laughs> yes. With these voices, we would have went really far. Should I watch the Katy Perry movie? It, you know, it's a great movie to have on while you um, like clean the house or put together some Ikea furniture. Okay. Good I, think, to know. I, think, I, I think I did both of those. Why didn't you put it. that on a documentary list? Come on, dude. It's not that good. My documentary list is spectacular. And the list that you'll have published by the time this airs about college curriculum, plug for property of Zach.com is also an excellent list. Love college curriculum. I am a college graduate and that is how I graduated with curriculum. Mm, mm, mm. Well, to close out Taylor Swift, can we do that forever and never discuss her on the podcast again? No, we'll probably be talking about her next week. A week from today, you know, I'm just thinking about it. We're going to have to record on Wednesday next week because a week from today, Apple Music launches. Oh, yeah. It's going to be a big day. Big day in the industry. Wonderful. I'm expecting some big stuff. 
I'm expecting a new album from my favorite artist, Kanye West. You know, you, you insulting Kanye does offend me. You know, I'm a big Yeezus fan. I'm not, that big of, I'm not that big a fan of his back catalog. In fact, I really didn't love any record until Yeezus, but there's a couple songs on Yeezus. I think Black Skinhead's the best instrumental track on a song probably the past 10, 20 years. I, I made a mistake where I was when Yeezus came out where I was like, I'm going to try to get into Kanye West. And I tried with Yeezus, and I was like, I'm never listening to this dude again. Uh, there's some great songs. The first four songs are just magic. In fact, I, I still have Yeezus in my iTunes library, and anytime someone's looking through my like music on my phone or computer, they're like, Yeezus? Like, why do you have this? I'm like, I tried. I don't know what you want from me. <laughs> we, we all tried. You, you know, it was an interesting thing, So, because I'm going to switch over to Apple Music. I, I started to you know, vacuum out my uh, iTunes of all the records I tried on. Ah. And it's really stunning how many records you, you, you give it that college try, but that's the great thing with streaming music is you just don't remember when you give them that try anymore. I'm kind of curious to see, not the short term, but like when we revisit in six months Apple Music, if it's like, you know, good and functional, like the the aspect of us, you know, you will be able to save uh, born this way <laughs> onto your library if you don't have it already, right? Yes. Um, and I'm really curious to see what that does for our sense of digital ownership. Um, and I know people like in, who use Spotify all the time don't necessarily care, but I think a lot of those people also have like the your music section from iTunes turned on. But hmm. I'm just curious to see like, let's say I buy uh, a Citizen just released an album today. If I didn't have the Citizen music in my iTunes library, like let's just say I got a download. I Sorry, I got shipped Citizen's new record from Run For Cover and there's a download code in it, right? Um, would I be so inclined to even like type in and download that digital music that I technically bought if I could just hit save on iTunes instead, on Apple Music instead for the album? Like I'm, that's what I'm curious to see the effect of, you know? Hmm. And I don't know if that matters. I mean, it would matter obviously if like, run for cover records pulled their catalog from apple music or it would matter if apple music shut down and I, but i wonder if we're not going to care about that because we're just lazy human beings and i think we're we are lazy human beings I, I mean for sure so i'm curious i'm just curious i guess um because i the more i think about it the more it's like is this a good way for digital downloads to die <laughs> i don't know like yeah download I, I just I, I think that there's gonna be enough of an archive of music that I don't think we really have to worry about it. But at the same time, one of the things I lament all the time is that like half the seven, seven inches put out in the 90s screamo bands that I used to go see in basements don't exist online. And there's a whole lost, lost era of underground music right now. And who knows? Maybe th this could be a thing. I mean, I think there's also somebody made a really good point uh, that there's a whole lost era of people who just would upload their songs to MySpace, but not to like a tune core. Oh yeah, totally. There's like a whole lost era of like demo bands who don't have back. You know, truth be told. So I had, uh, I, I did this record for the militia group with this kid, Chase Pagan. And during the record, he recorded um, the Jesse Cannon theme song. And it used to be my, you know, remember when you used to be able to go to a MySpace and it would play your theme song or like whatever I song you, you chose? Gonna, I thought you were going to say that it used to be your ringtone. No, 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 no. So it was like that song that would play when you came to my profile. But I realized I did not have it anymore because like I was like seven busted iTunes hard drives down the line of, you know, I'm now on like my 15th Macintosh uh, computer and I just couldn't find which old dead one it was on. And so I had to like rip it off of MySpace. It was horrifying. Huh. Did you rip it? So it was this, can I hear this song? Yeah. Like, can, can you play oh, it yeah. right? Can you play it right now? Like in this up right now? We're not playing it on the episode. I'll send it to oh. you. It's not happening. Unbelievable. Is it, does it mention your uh, alter ego uh, music project? It does not mention that. Um, it actually talks about... Um, What's the name of that again? You, you know what I know is really funny? I got a notification on Facebook that it had three new views this week. And I was like, oh, fuck. Oh, someone, man. Found the, someone found the Facebook page. <laughs> I got really scared. I was going to come on this episode and you were going to, I was found out by you. <laughs> oh, I wish. Jeez. What a bummer for me. Yeah. 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 All right. Let's move on to more pressing things. So, um, speaking of pressing things, um, and people who probably don't press their clothes, one of the 
fuckboys from Attila, who's not the one who sings the homophobic things, but apparently another rocket scientist from the band, uh, apparently saw Piper from Orange is the New Black selling inmates underwear on the new season of Orange is the New Black and went cha-ching! And uh, he's decided to launch Rock Closet, which is a site where you can buy the sweaty clothes or whatever from the closet of your favorite musicians. I do wonder, as a quick side note, if that uh, if that domain was open or if he had to spend a lot of money for it. I don't necessarily think it's a good domain. It's just a mm-hmm. name. But part of me is like, this domain had to not be open. Yeah, that, that, that seems like that was a domain that was at least squatted at some point. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm with you there. So I had missed this until Jesse pointed it out as we were doing our little pre-show talk. <sighs> this is very concerning to me. That I mean, I, I am happy to know. I am happy that for Jesse's next birthday, I can get him a pair of Attila underwear. <laughs> that, that would be fitting with your past gifts to me, since uh, you know the I'm looking at the insane cloud posse hoodie right now. You could wear that. That could you could wear them together. So what, what if you got me Attila gym shorts and I wore it with the insane cloud posse hoodie to the barbecue this weekend and just like shirtless, like under it. Uh, yeah, like, I think that is a thing that is going to be happening and we'll take pictures and that'll be that. And then we'll uh, not do this podcast anymore. I've been getting in shape, man. The, 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 the pecs are getting there. Oh boy. (laughs) This is what the people want to hear. So anyway, anyway, like, let's be serious about this. There's part of me that's like, God, I knew this was inevitable. I feel like this is also one of those ideas. I've heard 50 people tell me about this idea. And I've been like, just don't do that. We don't we don't want to make the world this horrible of a place. And now it's here. And like, I keep saying it, like, I'm happy for musicians to get money any way they feel is ethical. But man, like, this really bums me out that it's come down to selling your dirty underwear from stage on a website. I think it's not a surprise. I think that Franz from Attila... This is Franz, right? No, no, no. That's the other fuck... uh, Another fuck boy from the same band. Oh, interesting. Well, I think Attila in general... Oh, it's Chris from Attila. Let's call him another homophobic enabler in the band. I think... I I can't remember it's him or the bassist, so I won't throw one of them further under the bus, but one of them's like the worst. I think it might be the basis. They're, they're all they're, they're all in Attila. They're all the worst. I think it's not a surprise that it's from Attila because they fashion themselves as businessmen. So a startup. The, 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 let's be honest here. They have like a startup incubator of that bad. Like uh, the likes have we never talked? Have we ever talked about Attila's uh, startup company? Yeah, no, we, we 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 talked about Franz's startup company. I think. Okay, good. I, I just want to make sure. By now, their incubator is doing better than Ehrlich Bachman's. <laughs> Yeah, so I think this is like I don't know. I don't. Well, I, don't I see this dying before it starts because uh, the Facebook page has 88, 86 likes. Sorry. See, see, that was the thing when I went to the dude from Suicide Silences page, page. Like and the Twitter page has one hundred eighty eight. The Twitter page has one hundred eighty eight followers. How much are they selling this stuff for? I don't know. There was like a skateboard for like seventy five or a hundred or something. Then, wow. I mean, I think this is also going to think like if if we want to be really serious, this is how you sell your drumsticks to a kid and things like that. And like, you know, while I've never been like I've never been somebody who wants somebody's autograph and I've never been like the type, I don't fangirl like that. Actually, we should not say fangirl. I think that that's very degrading to girls. Oh, my God. I'm looking at this website. The uh, guitarist from Amur, another misogynistic, oh, yeah. homophobic band is selling used artist wristbands from Bamboozle t- 2012. Yeah, yep, that's how, that's how it's going down. But what uh, for $16? That's actually not that bad. If you're a kid who really loves a band, that's not bad. But oh. so the point I was going to make is so, so so I wrote this article on about the death of CDs for Alternative Press this week and some kid tweeted at me said, "Yeah, CDs rule. You can't get your iPhone autographed." I thought that was really interesting is that like, yeah, there are people who really value this stuff and they do want that special thing that's just personalized and just for them. And as much as I'm not that type of person, like I don't think I have an autographed anything that might not be true, but I don't think I really have much. There's definitely nothing autographed hanging in my house or anything. I think that that's fucking 
crazy, but I also see, think there is a market for it. I think this could do great. Oh, yeah. The thing is, like, there's a market for most things in the world, uh, especially for, for a lot of things to get exploited. And look, at the end of the day, like, I, I wish this was like an Etsy for artists, but it's not like an Etsy for artists. It's like, uh, let me take off my jeans and sell these to you. And that, that I don't know. I just, that just does, whether it was a tiller or not, that just kind of doesn't leave a great feeling in my heart. Zaki, I just had a realization for you. Yeah. I, I saw that you're now an indie rock manager. Yeah, I am an indie rock manager. Good. My artist got a 7.3 on Pitchfork today. That is leagues better than any Death Cab for Cutie album has gotten in uh, Pitchfork in years. <laughs> <laughs> Deservedly so. Stereo Gum <laughs> Artist of the Week. Yeah, yeah. So as an indie uh, artist manager, please address me how you see fit. Um, wait, wait, wait. You, did you say that uh, 7.3? Three? Yeah. You know the joke. I don't know. That every record gets a 7.3 on, on Pitchfork? Pitchfork. There's, like, there's like get, a whole they tumbler get, They get like a 3.3 three or a 7.3, and I will take my No, seven. no, no, no. Like, like, like 7.3 is like, th that's the one they give. Like, that's the number. Because, like, you know, Pitchfork's all about not ever saying anything is that great. Yeah. So that's as good as you really get. That means I, and then I'm clearly an indie rock artist yeah. manager. Yeah. Like that, that solidifies it, I think. But I'm saying, I think you got a great startup now that you're an indie rock manager. This, this Etsy for artists, I mean, you can get the, um, the waves and that chick from Best Coast to like knit things of Snacks the Cat and stuff. Like you could do all sorts of arts and crafts. Like, so I just started, a, I just started, I just started a new business is what you're saying. I, I'm telling you. You think Franz will, you think Franz will incubate me? I, I think Franz will be happy to make an artisanal, cap that said says so who's the faggot now for you wow just so the kids know that's a attila joke that's he actual lyrics from attila they're selling uh at warp tour they're on warp tour um they're selling white uh snapback hats with embossed uh with the word in with the word sick embossed on it also white um and they're i don't know mm. if, i don't know if i showed you their stage outfit from skate and surf but they're mimicking it at um uh, uh, Warp Tour. Franz is in an all white jumpsuit. Um, like, a, what, what, you know, like the suits, like you, the in movies that the CDC wears, you know, like they all yell, like, yeah, 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 yeah. Hazmat suit. Yeah, it's like an all white hazmat suit without the big puffy head thing, you know? Um, and then the rest of the band all wears white as well, but it's not like a hazmat suit. It's really something like, you know, it's 103 degrees in Arizona right now where Warped Tour is and he's wearing that today. Cool. Um, it's uh, so, so, so wait, did you watch them? Oh, Jesse. Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to make sure you, you did the right thing. Of course I watched them. I, I never know with you. You know, I'm a, I'm, I'm a hit. I'm a hypocrite. I obviously watched them. So moving on still into the tech world uh so bloomberg business week did a uh really cool issue that i think will still be on the stands when this airs if you act quickly yeah i need to buy the physical issue too yeah i bought the physical issue and then i mostly used the website but the physical issue is definitely cool too for like when i wanted to re-ingest some things so Bloomberg did this uh, uh, this issue, and there's also an online company to it where they explain code in all the coding terms you need to know as somebody who's not going to actually learn to code. And it's, it was very helpful for me as somebody who's perpetually working on a startup right now and always is interested in ideas with code and wanting to know and not wanting to sound like an idiot when I talk to other members of a team about what they do. This thing was insanely, insanely helpful. I mean, it took me about 12 hours to read it, but I had a nice relaxing weekend this weekend. And uh, it is just a really, really great thing uh, that somebody did 38,000 words on explaining code to people who don't know what the hell is going on in most of coding so that we all sound like less of idiots when we talk to people who do. Yeah, it was written by Paul Ford. It's the first time that Bloomberg or that Business Week, so the, the magazine, it's, there's no other story. It's just whatever, 30, I don't know how many pages it is, X dozen pages solely on this. Uh, it's really like a book, and that's the only thing in it, and it's really cool. Uh, Paul, uh, Paul Ford wrote it. Also, if you're interested in the story in general, Paul Ford was on Joshua Topolsky's Tomorrow podcast about it. Um, 
Um, and I, that was really enjoyable too for me. It's really, I have not read it yet because it is a mammoth and I'm a little behind on life right now and I'm looking forward to reading it and I want to pick up the physical version, but, um, it's, as I talked about on this podcast episode, it, it feels like it could be one of those things that like a, uh, computer science or whatever, something some, like it could be taught in school based off of this article and, yeah, and yeah. uh, re, what really is like a research document of where code started and where it remains in 2015 and where it will go. And I think that's really cool. Um, so I do, I do as someone who's not read it fully, but has heard lots of things about it and read lots of things about it. Um, I would fully recommend, um, reading it. You can just Google, um, what is code? Uh, what is code Bloomberg? And it'll pop right up. Um, if you have any time over the weekend or whatever, grab a coffee, tea, iced tea, or beer, and uh, go for it. You're probably going to need about a 32 ounce of water over how long it takes to do. Yeah, it's like a it's, book. It's, it's, it's it, really it, engrossing. What's cool is on the – well, what's cool is if you do it on the site, too, is there's certain things that you, like – it shows you what happens when you code things, and it really makes you understand it. That's why I think it's so cool is this is really a great tool. And it was really lit. I mean, maybe for my level of layman's, it was written perfect for, but they kind of aimed, since Bloomberg's a business-facing thing, they aimed it at somebody who's, like, business-educated but kind of got lapsed by the code thing. And uh, it really is just fantastic. Yeah, I thought it was great. All right, so I think it's great that it exists, and I, I'm sure it will be great when I read it. So, so you want to do a few questions? Yeah, we have a few questions um, from at Fallout Guy seventy eight. Why do some vinyl come with CD copies instead of download codes? Does that maybe count as two sales of an album or cheaper? This is kind of interesting, Jesse. Did you know that uh, a certain record label has begun including CDs in every um, vinyl sale? Is this a new thing? When I used to do drug front records with my friend, we used to do this in every release, even five years ago. I had never heard of it before. Before really? uh, we, we did before, it in every single, every single one. one. I had never heard of it before Knuckle Puck launched pre-orders uh, for the new album on Rise Records. Who do this? Hmm. Uh, you know, I you know I suggest doing this in my book, and I think that's now two two years old or something. I, I suggest well, doing really, that. it's just a day old. Well, yeah, totally. But yeah, uh, so like Rise Records, for example, if you buy a copy of the vinyl album, you also get a CD with it. Um, I would say, while I honestly cannot fully 100% confirmably say that Rise would count a sale of vinyl as a sale of a CD and vinyl. I would imagine some people would think that's sketchy at the same time. It says it in the uh, product description that you're buying the vinyl and the CD and it's for a reasonable cost. So I think it's interesting. And I would assume that the answer is yes, that those are double counted and you are getting two music products out of it. Um, I don't think they would be triple counted <laughs> as in you get vinyl CD and digital, but I would imagine that yes, you, you just, it's no different than buying a CD and vinyl record separately in your cart. It's the same thing. Um, what do you think of that? So do you think, what do you think of that in terms of the sales side? I think there's the one thing, like, so I wrote about this in this article today is like, you know, Apple's obviously doing everything they can to kill CDs dash DVDs, um, which is also good for them because then it gets more people renting things on iTunes. Um, so I can foresee a world like, let's say you just got your like many knuckle puck fans are you're an 18 year old. You just graduated from high school and grandma buys you that sweet new MacBook that we all want so bad. Oh, uh, so bad. I know. I told you. I think I told you. I opted out of getting it. And I just upgraded my computer. Oh, you didn't um, tell me what you got. Oh no! I just I just did a uh, SSD upgrade on my hard drive. I got convinced, but th that's for another time. Um. So anyway, um. And then this kid has to buy a CD bird or do it. And I think that you know, while CDs are in, it's out. But then I also see it as a thing of like, as the article I just did says, there's there's so many people still with uh, CD players in their car, and they can rock that out. And they can choose to rip it at whatever quality they want. And people still just like to support something. It's still really easy for someone at a merch table to pick, spend $5 on something. Like, that is just the truth. CDs are not dead yet. Um, and I don't know when they're going to die, if ever. Um, I, 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 I did some math that wasn't in, in the article. 
And it looks like if cars really are being the main propping up of it, we still got another five to six years before most of the cars with that don't have aux inputs are off the road. Yeah, I would. That's actually that is a very good point. Actually, we're still time away from that, though. Yes, five to six years is a long time. I mean, by then, streaming music services like being a thing will be like what seven, eight years old. Yeah, wow, that's kind of funny. To but think but about. seven to eight years old to everybody using CDs, cassettes were still really prevalent. Prevalent. Yeah, people uh, were still making each other mixtapes as ways to get into each other's pants. Then, do you think the playlist is the new uh, mixtape? Well. See, this is the thing of calling something is the new is because that like makes it like that there. It's like like when you say orange is the new black, orange and black are colors. Playlists and mixtapes really aren't the same thing because it's just there, you, there's not that physical thing you give. And I think that's the thing is it used to be like a gift. Like I, I would give this, you know, cute girl with a triple mohawk a mixtape of some sweet pop punk jams that I listened to what I felt about her. And I could just watch her melt into, as she'd read the playlist. And that just doesn't happen anymore. I love that. I love that thought. I love I love the idea of you making a playlist for a girl with a mohawk. Not a, Zach, not a mohawk, a triple mohawk, because I dated more than one girl with a triple mohawk. What's a triple you? mohawk? Don't mind me Googling it's this like, right like, now. It's, it's like when you got the two other sides and the one at the top. Whoa. One yeah. second. <laughs> Internet is loading, loading. Oh my god, I've never <laughs> seen this before. You're so not punk, dude. Holy moly. People of the li- uh, people. Oh my god, I can't even get words out. Also, for what it's worth, I do not see a single girl on this Google Images list. It's just guys. Uh, please, if you're listening to this, uh, if you're listening to this, take your hand off the steering wheel. Um, if you feel free to crash your car while you Google triple Mohawk. Um, wow. That was worthwhile. Thank you. Well, you, you know, one day when we do a Patreon for this uh, site, one of the prizes will be, uh, that you get pictures of me and all the girls with triple Mohawks I've dated. <laughs> oh my God. Yep. Yep. That's it. That's what we're doing. Sounds good. Wow. All right. All right. From from uh, Anthony Fartino. Oh, we love this guy. Um, what are some best practices for selling photos and or art to bands? And um, this is a good time with Taylor Swift. Um, for art, and I, I can I can maybe say better for art. Well, I can say for both because I for Knuckle Puck we paid someone who took photos today. Um, look, if you're if you have a friend, if you're a really small band, like you don't have a van, you don't have a trailer, whatever. I you know like try to get a presentable picture for yourself. Don't be like climbing up the side of a wall when you take a press photo. No one wants that. Just do a normal photo, but. If you have any money to spare and if the photographer considers himself to be a real photographer, there should be some kind of compensation. Um, for Knuckle Puck, we, um, sometimes we get little features in all press and they often need photos of the guys that we don't have on hand or exclusive photos. And we'll, we'll typically pay the photographer 50 to $200 or more depending on what kind of photo or how many photos there is. Um, Knuckle Puck wants to get paid for their art, and we think our other artists should get paid for the art that help us spread ours. And that's for any band I work with, uh, unless it's truly like a hookup favor or like a best friend quick thing. And that is the rare, uh, that is more the exception to the rule. Um, in terms of art, like in terms, I don't know if you're talking about like t shirt designs, um, a, a lot of like the standard uh bands in i don't know the warp tour world smaller warp tour worlds t-shirt designs typically pay around a hundred dollars per t-shirt design um i don't know you're allowed to think that is crazy good crazy bad or indifferent but that's just kind of the standard for what most of my bands pay for shirt designs um 150 to 250 dollars um hopefully that's a little helpful Uh, the other thing i would say is um like most things in this scene, um, the best thing you can do is just work for somebody and then ask them when you give them a good rate when you're starting out to recommend you to everybody they can. Maybe even make a rewards program if they recommend you that you'll do the next thing 
for cheaper because really recommendations go farther than anything else. Um, whether that's recording, photos, artwork, etc. I always see that most of the people I know, they and myself included as a producer, mixing, mastering engineer, um, I get most of my work through recommendations. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's good. I think, you know, everything is feeling it out at first, but you, uh, for anyone that does like sell or take photographs or art or whatever, like, um, you know, don't let yourself get bullied around. Don't be outrageous, but don't let yourself get bullied around. Like, um, you should be valued as well as the artists, um, who are making the music. Um, we have time for one or two more, um, from wish I was Tomas. Um, is that, is it still common practice for opening acts to buy on to a tour? Um, I would say yes and no. Uh Um, no, uh, no, in the sense that I think it's happening a lot less year over year. Yes. In the sense that I know I still get buy on, I get buy on offers in 2015 for bands I work with. Um, but I, I think it's continually less and less happening. I, maybe less and less is the way to put it. I, I, I agree with you, but I think maybe what it is is um, that peaked in the MySpace shitty swoop haircut deep V era. And I think it's diminished since then. But yes, it still exists and it still is a thing. Um, but I, I think that that is somewhat on the way out. But like, yeah, if you're like the type of bad, like, you know, you're like, some 15 year old bad, like Echo, Echo Smith or whatever, and you're trying to do that thing. That's the world you live in. But buy ons are not going to be as common if you're trying to get a tour with, let's say, some gruffy punk bands or some twinkly cord emo bands. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, and last question. Band, and this is from Ian E. Baldwin, frequent listener of the podcast. Thank you. I've noticed bands putting out their records weeks before uh, their official release day on Bandcamp. Do those sales count towards first week of sales when the record officially hits store on iTunes? I know the music services such as Spotify, Apple Music, RDO, and others streams mean something as well to the count uh, towards a band album sales. 1,500 song streams from an album to one equivalent sale on Billboard. I would love to know your thoughts. Um, Yes, if you sell something on Bandcamp, it uh, will go towards your UPC barcode for the album and will register and will go towards a sound scan sale. Um, yes. Um, what do I think of that? I think uh, I don't think bands usually put their albums on Bandcamp a week early. I think they only do if it leaks. A uh, good example to, to, to mention Citizen again would be their album leaked two weeks early. So Run for Cover put it on Spotify for five dollars as a pre order before the album came out today and hopefully got good sales on that and sent it off the sound scan. But it's just a pre-order like anything else is. Um, you can stream a song maybe, maybe you can stream more, or get individual songs to download, but it's really no different than having it on iTunes. Uh, so that those are kind of my thoughts. Um, streaming, st- in terms of what you mentioned of streams uh, counting toward album sales, they only count in the week that they're released or occur. I was under the impression originally, and I was proved wrong, or uh, rather than I was then I then was informed that um, during, let's just say an album came out on June 23rd. If a single was streamed three weeks earlier on Spotify, that's not necessarily going towards the sale of an album. It's a week by week basis, just like sales are. Um, but streams, it, it, it seems like uh, pre streams of an album release are not like a pre order of buying an album beforehand. If that makes sense. Um, maybe everything I said is gibberish. Hopefully not. No, that was all very good. So do you have any recommendations? I uh, started, uh, I wonder if you're going to make fun of me for this. <laughs> I started a new show this weekend called I Zombie. Um, it's like Veronica Mars. I, I, ch- I tried to watch it. I thought it was, it was not good. Oh, that's right up my alley. If you like Veronica Mars at all, like this show is truly for you. I, I, I did not like Veronica Mars. Shockingly. I'm super happy with it. It's just a 13 episode season. It's on the CW. Um, I would also, I don't know if I've recommended this yet. And if I have, I'm recommending it again. There's a new Gimlet media podcast called mystery show. Um, the first episode I was a little discouraged by, uh, and I'm absolutely head over heels in love with everything since I think it's brilliant and, 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 uh, just fantastic. Okay, I'm going to give it another try because that first episode made me hit delete like halfway through. Yeah, agreed. You should really give it a try. Like, I'm infatuated by it. It's seriously phenomenal. Um, I can't do Reply All either. 
I, just, oh, I, I do like Reply All. Yeah, it doesn't do it for me. So I saw Run the Jewels. Oh, yeah, I saw that on your something feed. They, they were one of the best live bands I've ever seen. Wow. They were just, just in, it, the, more energy coming off that stage than anything I've seen in a long time. It was just phenomenal. Nas even came up and did a song. It was awesome. I know who that is. Oh, that's good. I'm very proud of you. He had an album called Illmatic. That, that, that is right. It is arguably one of the best hip-hop records ever made. made. Ever, right? Ever. Yeah. Um, and then lastly, uh, that I think is very relevant for anybody who likes this podcast, is uh, my dear good friend Finn McKenty, who's a brilliant motherfucker and helps run Creative Live, uh, has started a new website called Punk Rock MBA, where he takes lessons from punk and underground skating culture and stuff like that and applies it to as if you were getting a business degree. And uh, it's really good stuff. I'm going to hopefully be writing something for it in the future. Um, and you should check it out, subscribe to it, and make sure you follow it because if you like this podcast, you would love what he's doing. And he's a brilliant dude, so you should really tune in. Um, well, thank you for listening to Off the Record this week. If you listen live on Adobe, you can find us at Off the Record at FM to subscribe to us or find us on iTunes or your podcast client of choice. And we'll be back next week. <laughs>